I'm going to talk this morning, God willing, on the family of God. And specifically, uh, those who are, who can call God their father. And we call each other brother and sister. And we are meant to live together under God's will. And in Matthew chapter 12, verse 46 to 50, we see Jesus ask this question, Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? He asked this, well, and sisters, by the way. He asked this of the man who was saying to him, your, your brothers and your mother are outside. And Jesus said, in effect, Now I'm with my mothers and my brothers and my sisters and they're here with me and they're my disciples. I think today, is it right? Today is Father's Day and as we come as the family of God uh, we to remember that Jesus was born into a human family. His family tree was very ancient. There are TV programs that say, who do you think you are? And they go down the family tree and they find all sorts of scandals and people in there. And in Jesus' family tree, there are all sorts of people. There are murderers. There are Gentiles, people who aren't Jews. There are prophets. They are prostitutes. They are people who some are good and some are bad. And he was himself was born into a very poor family. We find from the Christmas story. The only thing he could afford, his mother and father could afford in the temple as a thank you to God were two pigeons. Not the ordinary sheep. His family was a poor family. His earthly father was a carpenter who lived in the remote part of Upper Israel, in Galilee of the Gentiles. And when age 30, Jesus left home. That will come to most of us. There's a time in our life when we leave home. We no longer live with our mum and dad. Perhaps we live with our, our wives and our children. Even if we don't have wives and children, most of us branch out. And there came a day when Jesus sold all his tools and packed up his shop and went and went to Capernaum to begin his ministry. And Capernaum was a Roman sort of town in the middle of Israel. It was part of a string of ten towns which were mostly Roman. They had Roman coins, Roman law, Roman councils. And he lived in this strange place. And his mother and fathers, uh, uh, and brothers rather, came down with him and saw him off. It says in Matthew chapter 4 verse 13, And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum which is by the sea. And in verse 17 of that same chapter, it says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. From that time. He changed not just where he lived, but what he did. He stopped being a carpenter, making the best tables and chairs we can imagine, and started being a preacher and started going around and saying to people, repent. The call of God to work as a builder had ended and his call to preach had begun. Jesus himself called it the acceptable year of the Lord. We often forget that Jesus was called by God to work as a carpenter for 20 years. 
didn't preach. He didn't do miracles. Nobody noticed him. His own cousin, John the Baptist, didn't even know him. Didn't, he, he said, I don't know him by sight, but I'll know him when I see him. And we can imagine how his earthly family reacted. Well, he's left the family business. Psalm 69 verse 8 says, and this is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus, I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children because zeal for your house has eaten me up. I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children. Joseph and Mary had an ordinary marriage. They had further children, we're told. He had three sis- they had three sisters. Jesus had three sisters and four brothers. And in John chapter 2, verse 17, this prophecy is applied to Jesus. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. Now his brothers could live peaceably when he was a carpenter. But when he became a preacher, he was a stranger to them, a foreigner to my mother's children. In this world, believers can be strangers in their own households. Not every household is a Christian household. Sometimes it can be split down the middle. I myself came from such a family, my father and my brother. My father was never a Christian and my brother isn't to this day. But my mother was a Christian and so in the providence of God I was as well. There can be a division in families over these things and And Jesus wanted to point out to the man who pointed to his family outside, on the outside, Jesus, your family's out there. And Jesus said, in effect, no, my family's in here, where God's people meet. We are all brothers and sisters to each other. As a rule of thumb, I was taught as a young man, Every young, if somebody's younger than you, you're a brother and sister. And if somebody's older than you, then they're your mother. And when Jesus was confronted by this man, he knew the power of family ties. Jesus had been brought up with these brothers who were strangers to him. They had, as all children do, secrets, confidences, experiences. They had family get-togethers where they had meals, where they play. They probably went on some sort of holiday now and again. Perhaps they, sh- they shared jokes. They found the same things funny. That's what happens in families. All these things we go through, they bind us together, don't they? Not just the good things. We all have the same grief sometimes when somebody dies in our family. We all have the same joy when somebody gets married. We can all receive the same comfort at funerals. It's family stuff. Jesus said this to his disciples. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. He said that in Luke chapter 21, verse 16. He knew that family life as a Christian can be difficult. You're out of tune with others in your family quite often. But the problem that Jesus had was on a spiritual level. His earthly family was ambitious. They were ambitious for him. They wanted him to succeed. 
when they planned for his future. Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples may see the works that you are doing. His brothers were giving him advice. They were trying to help him. They said, oh, we've seen these setbacks. Lots of disciples have just walked away from you. And you've even said to the 12 disciples who you specially chose, you too are going away. And his brothers thought he was going to be a failure. And so they said, get into Judea. That's where the movers and shakers are. Get into the, the place where people have authority and people have power. And start doing things there. They said, that your disciples may see the works that you were doing. And what was he doing? Well, he was back in Galilee, where he'd been brought up, in the middle of nowhere, as it were. And they said to him, you want to raise your profile, as it were, and go public. Now, Jesus was not like that. Often, when he did a miracle, he said to them, if you've been healed, he said to them, don't tell anybody. Go home, thank God, praise God in private, but don't tell anybody, because that was not what Jesus was about. Jesus was about collecting a family to be around him. Not just his earthly family, they had followed him in the providence of God. I guess his mother followed him, and then because his mother went with him, his brothers went with him. And so here's the advice, depart from here. They were telling Jesus how to live his life and go into Judea, that your disciples, we're only thinking about your disciples, he said. They said that they may see the works that you're doing. All these wonderful works, these healings, these miracles, why is nobody talking about them? In modern parlance, we would say, see how many likes you can get, how many retweets on how to be famous, how to be an influencer. Not in backwater Galilee, but in cosmopolitan Jerusalem. And then they thought they saw their opportunity. The Feast of Tabernacles, we had it in our reading. Hey! Isn't that when every Jew goes to Jerusalem? It was. Wouldn't it be fantastic if it, Jesus turned up there? Well, Jesus wasn't going to do that. And he told his brothers, I'm not going up yet. And when he did go up, he went up secretly. He went undercover. And all those people that didn't like him saying, well, where is he? We haven't seen him. He was going to be in the right place at the right time. But his earthly family had no idea of the timetable that he was on. Do it for the disciples, they said. Do it for the disciples. They need encouragement, don't they? And perhaps his brothers looked round and said, well, we've tried our best and he's not come up. What did they say next, these brothers? No one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. Is that right? No one does anything in secret? That doesn't sound like Jesus. Yes, he wanted to preach out in the open. But he would often go away by himself, secretly. He would leave his disciples. He would pray. And Jesus often told his own disciples, his spiritual family, to do things in secret. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. 
If you want to give something, give it secretly. Give it privately. The disciples were being taught this, but his family still had to learn. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Don't just do a miracle. Give it a bit of publicity. Jesus didn't publicise himself. As far as I'm aware, Jesus only ever appeared to two people who were non-believers after his resurrection. One was Paul, and he was the last one that Jesus appeared to. And the other was James. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7 and 8. He appeared to James, and then last of all to me, says Paul. And James was Jesus' brother. He appeared to the brother that did not believe in him. He appeared to the brother who was a stranger to him. In John 7, 3, Jesus' brothers urge him to do his works in front of his disciples. They were trying to remedy the disastrous state of affairs that Jesus had come to in his pronouncements. And from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Not just a few, many. What a great sadness Jesus must have had on that day. But he knew who was in his family and who wasn't. Then he said to his disciples, do you also want to go away? So, so here were his brothers. Show yourself to the, to the world. And in verse 5 of John, in that chapter it says, for even his brothers did not believe in him. Can you imagine what sort of life Jesus had? His own brothers did not believe in him. They wanted him to be famous. Perhaps they'd be famous as well because of that. This family, Jesus' earthly family, had seen a perfect witness. Jesus, if I can put it like this, never put a foot wrong. Never said a word out of place. He was always gracious. In fact, he was sinless. Imagine that, living with somebody who's sinless. Wouldn't you notice? I think you would. They heard the words that he said. Do you think he never talked to his brothers about God? Think he was silent? Didn't they see his joy and his happiness in his father? Didn't they have the greatest example of righteousness in their family that the world would ever have? What a blessed family. Yet his brothers did not believe in him. 25 years perhaps, for some of them. They did not believe in his mission and they did not believe in his gospel. His mother did, for certain. Full of grace. Perhaps his sisters did. But James and Joseph and Simon and Jude, his four brothers, no. And you think, well, did Jesus pray for his brothers? Of course he did. Did he weep for them? Of course he did. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 13, verse 57. A prophet is not without honour in his own country and in his own house. And in his own house. People on the outside can see him for what he is. But 
people who lived closest to him, nothing at all. Now, this is more common amongst us than we imagine. Most of us don't have completely believing families. I don't expect to see my dad in heaven. And that makes me very sad. When I became a Christian at the age of 20, I prayed for my dad and my brother, and I still pray for my brother now, that they would find God. And they never did. My father died without God and without hope. And I shall never see him again, except on the judgment day. And Jesus, he was to die before any of his brothers were sought and saved and sanctified. And we can see the power of evil to blind sinners to the truth. And that's why we have the necessity of a spiritual family. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 15 says this, has this phrase, the whole family in heaven and earth. One of my best friends died about 10 years ago and uh, he had dementia. And the thing with dementia is you, you, you learn to have the same conversation over and over again. And that's okay. Because if they're your friend, you know where to start. And I knew how to start with Pete. He was my friend. And I would always say to him, and how did you meet your wife? And that never went. He'd forget who his sons were. He'd forget who his daughter was. He wouldn't know their names. I remember sitting, sitting down once in a cafe and I used to take them out, him and his wife, every month. And he said to me, when's this, when's this dinner coming then? And I had to say to him, Pete, you've just eaten it. That's how bad things can get. But there was one thing that I found upsetting. He'd always ask, almost as a matter of course, and how's your mum? Every time I met him, he would say that, first thing. Oh, nice to see you again. And how's your mum? And there came the day when my mother died and went to heaven, and I was upset, and he'd, he'd come in, he'd, the first thing he'd say when he met me was, and how's your mum? And I didn't know then what I know now. You have to be careful. And I would say to him, for the first few times, my mum died. And he would grieve every time I said it. Because he couldn't remember. And it was like being reminded of something that was awful, that had happened to his best friend. And in the end, I remembered what it said in Ephesians. We have, as Christians, we have family in heaven and on earth. And because they're in heaven, we can be happy. So I learned to say, when he said, and how's your mum, which he still kept saying, I would always say, never better. She's happier now than she's ever been. And that's where I left it. Because it's true. If you have family in heaven, you can rest with hope. You can have that future that one day we'll all be there. I trust one day all of us will be in heaven and will be never better. What a hope and a description of those who have faith in God's family. 
Paul puts it in these terms in Romans chapter 8, verse 14. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, and I trust that's every Christian, these are the sons of God, the family of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Isn't that true? The Holy Spirit comes into our lives when we become Christians and he makes us cry out with a spirit of adoption, Abba, Father. I'm in your family. Whatever your earthly family is, when you become a Christian, you have an extra dad. And as Jesus said, you have an extra mother's. The same are my mother's. The same are my brothers. The same are my sisters. This is what Jesus said. And to be adopted into God's family is the most glorious thing. And it's his greatest blessing. In our reading, Jesus' family was standing outside. And people were saying, you go to them. And Jesus was standing inside. And he told this man virtually, no, they have to come to me. Now we know at least two of Jesus' brothers were saved and did become Christians. And our prayers may be for decades. We may even die before God answers our prayers. But Jesus answered, answer came after he was ascended into heaven. It says he appeared to James because he never gave up on his family. Whoever they were to him, whoever they wanted to manipulate him, he always loved them and he always cared for them. And that's why Jesus said to his disciples, well, you're family to me. You're family to me. You don't have to be born into my family. God has arranged an adoption. But if you love me, you will say what I say. And when Jesus prayed to his father, he always said, Abba. Abba, Father, Daddy. And that's how Christians are in this world. We are in two families. Our spiritual family has a father who helps us, who cares for us, who disciplines us. We're not allowed to be unforgiving to our, towards our brothers and sisters. We're not allowed to not love them or hold a grudge. In Luke chapter 8, verse 19 and 21, it says this, My mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. Think of how long Jesus loved his own brothers before they came to him. He never gave up on them. He prayed for them every day. And if your children here today... Your mum and dad were probably praying behind your back and you don't even know it sometimes. And that's what Jesus did. He prayed and he witnessed and he showed a good example and he heard the word of God and he did it. And we who are Christians, this is what we do. My mother and my brothers. It's strange having two mothers or three or four. Jesus once said to his disciples, seek the kingdom of God first and all things, all these things should be added to you. You will have mothers. I can testify that I've had many mothers in this place who have helped me and treated me like a son. Many sisters who have helped me, many brothers that have prayed for me. 
They have heard the word of God and they do it. Are we in God's family? Have we that patience that Jesus had? Have we that disappointment to bear over many years? Let's not stop. Let's hear the word of God and do it. Amen.